Hello, I'm Danny Black with Hobby News Daily, back with another edition of the Hobby News Daily Hot Corner, joined by my good friend, John Keating. What's going on, John? Toodles, how are you? What's up, Toodles? Um, nothing. I wanted to uh, talk some vintage cards, and I thought I went through my Rolodex, and I was looking for old people, and I got to K, and that's it. Let's call John. I'm number 792 on your list, right? You- no, you're within, the, you're within the base set. You're within that okay. first 660. Yeah. Awesome. No, dude, I'm glad to have you. It's long overdue. Uh, mea culpa, but glad glad you're coming on. Thanks for having me, man. No, absolutely. And one of the reasons I wanted to have you on is because this is a fun segment. The reason we call it the Hot Corner is you've, if you've ever scored in baseball, third base is position number five, and the nickname is the Hot Corner. And so we do five questions. So I'm going to start out. Oh, we got you ready. All right. So I, I think I know the answer. I usually say, are you ready for the Hot Corner? But, John, are you ready for the Hot Corner? Go. All right. Greatest third baseman of all time. Let's answer a question by asking a question. Would you have, rather have a guy with a killer bat and a killer glove or a guy with a killer glove and kind of a lukewarm bat? I, uh, I'm, I'm going to decline the premise of the question. Right. So the greatest third baseman of all time is Michael Jack Schmidt. He's definitely in the top three, no doubt. If Brooks Robinson had played more than 80% of his games on AstroTurf, I think we might have seen a different Brooks Robinson. Great player, great fielder, but the guy was playing out there in the sand traps. Mike Schmidt was playing on the concrete. That factors into why I I disagree with you, but and we'll throw all the George Brett people. You can stay out of the comments. Um, Whatever. Yeah, exactly. Um, I, well, yeah, we don't have to worry about small market third base, but don't worry about right, it. Right. God, you're really helping us. The bread, the bread, the bread alliance is coming. Uh, so here, here's my thing on Schmidt. Uh, I think he's slightly overrated with the bat. I think he's slightly overrated with the glove, but the combination of the two has boosted his reputation. Um, and I think not enough people recognize the environment Brooks was playing in and playing in the lineup next to, you know, Frank Robinson. I mean, Brooks has an MVP. He's got a couple World Series. So you're saying he benefited from being in a lineup with Frank Robinson. So his no. offensive numbers would have even been more. No, I'm saying that I think it made him look worse. Okay. Did I he think bat in front of Frank or behind Frank, you know? I think it depended on the year. Brooks okay. would bat as low as six some years. Um, okay, I got you. But you had Boog a lot Pal. of confidence they had in him putting. Down well, you had there. you had Boog Pal, you had Boog Pal on that team. That's true. Yeah, good point. Uh, so there was a lot of th- thunder right in the middle there. So, so listen, I I grew up. Brooks was a little bit before your time, but we've all seen the film. Uh, I grew up watching Schmidt from the time I can remember, which is around the time he came on. So I s- saw Schmidt charge balls uh, one handed. Uh, again, you're dealing with the AstroTurf, which means faster players, faster balls coming at you and all that stuff. So that's why I, that's why I, what's that? Easier environment to hit in also. Well, yeah, that, that, again, it's, it's, it was harder to get balls past the guy on an easier environment. It made all my points for me. I appreciate it. No, no, but I'm saying his numbers are better because he played on AstroTurf. No, nah, I disagree. Because if you're telling me, which most people will tell me, is he was just a home run hitter, what does that have to do with AstroTurf, right? I didn't say that. Huh? Nah. I just think, uh, you know, again, I've spoken about this recently and uh, throughout my life. Is like it, It's funny because he was much maligned when he was here. Like he was very divisive, Schmidt was. And now he is, again, I'll say it again, he's – the most beloved athlete in Philadelphia sports history. I have no doubts about that, which is an interesting, you know, the half that loved him and the half that hated him. Now it's just a whole that loves him, which is, which is pretty interesting. I know Brooks was beloved his entire time in Baltimore, but uh, yeah, Schmidt, you know, people realize the haters back then, like my father, who's not here, but uh, would realize what a, the guy really was a talent, you know, watch sure. them day in and day out so and i think we both agree all kidding aside that we can love our own player and actually yeah. still respect the other player um yeah so, so let's, let's talk about something real quick and i don't want to drag it on what's interesting is the history of third baseman throughout baseball it was kind of a yes. place where you put your dogs right uh you know 76 uh 
Sporting News all time grades in the top subset had Pie Trainer as the, as the best third, ba- third baseman, completely ignoring Eddie Matthews and yeah. what he did with his bat. And Eddie Matthews, it took him, I think, 10 years at least to get into the Hall of Fame after he retired. So the amount of great third baseman until Brooks came along, I guess I consider Eddie Matthews great too, but until sure. Brooks no. find the defensive end, it's just it's phenomenal that the sport went at least a half a decade without recognizing there were any good third baseman or having any good third baseman. I'll go a step further. It probably took the 70 world series against where Brooks, you know, tore the world apart um, to okay. even get recognition, you know, on the national stage. I, I'll agree with you. Fair enough. Um, now from a hobby perspective, and this should have been question number two is who's got, who, who's rookie card, forget the Philadelphia side. Whose rookie card do you think is the tougher get or would you prefer to have? Because all three of them are relatively gettable rookie cards. Brooks, oh, Brett, and Schmidt. Oh, oh, I'd already forgotten about Brett again. Yeah, I throw him, uh, I throw him in there only because time-wise he fits you know, a right. little bit. Well, it, it's interesting because I think each three has a different – like the Brooks rookie is one of the most beautiful cards there is, right? Uh, and, and I'm not going to mention – I'm not going to mention the obvious, what happened in 58. The Schmidt card is hideous because it's a three-player card. And the Brett card, you know, so most iconic would be the Brett card, I think, because there is a generation like myself who that was the, uh, like, the meat of their their boyhood collecting, the, one of the first things they remember, kids who grew up in the 70s. So there's iconic, which is Brett. There's expensive or valuable, which is Schmidt, and there's – uh, hobby beauty, which I think is Brooks. Maybe Brooks is more expensive than Schmidt. I guess maybe I don't know. No. Um, Brooks is surprisingly undervalued. Um, yeah, I, you know, I I, I should I should have one. It's all my to do. Um, right. But every time I go to buy it, I'm always like, these are undervalued. I really should do my research and find a good one. And then I don't yeah, if I it. had to look, if I was if I had to look based on looks, I would it would be Brooks, Brett, then Schmidt. Um, I, ha- I don't have a Brooks. I have the other two, obviously, but I don't have a uh, Brooks. And that is something I really need to get for sure. I was about to say, you want to go Brooks shopping at the National? Yeah, sure. Bro- we'll be the Brooks brothers. <laughs> <That's awesome. laughs> All right. That is the dad joke. Tip your waitress. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Um, so you already hinted at where I was going with my next question. We've talked about some third baseman and we've talked about some cards we do like. Is, is my time up? <laughs> no, man. Apparently, I'm very popular right now. One of my <laughs> one of my kids probably needs money. No, um, we're good. Hideous cards of all time, and Brooks was going to lead me into it because that's my vote. Um, is that 58 Brooks? Um, yeah the the, the uh, I'm going to the bathroom while I score. We really are polar opposites for sure. Uh, I'm a big fan of disparaging the 74 Ron Santo horizontal. Uh, beer league softball game with what looks like uh, Leo DeRocher in the background, either going number one or maybe perhaps doing something illegal behind Ron Santo. Uh, yeah. So I, that to me is my current, uh, my, my current <laughs> uh, hater card for sure. It's got everything going against it, right? Like a crappy horizontal card with pink, uh, with, with with pink highlighting for the the team name and the and and all that's in the city name. So yeah, well there you go. All right, this this might be a tough one, and and if it's too uh, out there, let me know. The last year that you can remember checklist being collectible, collectible guess, or last last time I remember, like 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 it being hard to find people set collecting it became people actually you know, yeah people what? actually using checklists for what they were intended i guess right yeah what i would you, say i would say probably around 1980 and, you're and gonna say the, end that, of, the end of vintage a lot well a lot of that has to do my i can speak from personal experience but i think that there may have been others as well uh with dr jim's uh book coming out in 79 right so that became the checklist uh scratching off or putting an X next to the name in his baseball guides, not his, uh, not his magazines, but in the guides, I, I recall that. And that's kind of what I see. In fact, it's funny because I'm sorting through some cards and I have some 80 checklists that are completely clean. So 79, 80, I, I would think 
Uh, I know I was a violator up until 1980 because I have 1980 cards with pen marks. But yes, so I'm going to say then. Okay. Just because uh, of the, just because of the guide, I think that had a lot to do with it. I think it's and maybe I'm wrong. I think it's one of the less spoken about parts of collecting and set collecting are the checklist. A lot of time unnumbered, a lot of time multiple, you know, printing or advertising and um, kind of the wild, wild west of, of set collecting for a lot of base top sets. I tell you, I have so many. Uh, and, and what's maybe something we should mention is there was checklist cards, but uh it, for sake of redundancy, they doubled down and, and most of the team cards were checklists. So you could uh, double your trouble by checklisting, marking off the checklist card and then marking off the team card. I have, I still have most of the ones I had from the seventies that I did. I'd fill them in. And then when I was done a big X on the back, that means that team's done. So yeah, it's uh, an interesting thing. That's for sure. Most satisfying set you've ever finished collecting? Um, a set that I I love. So satisfying was used on purpose. Yeah, a set that I love slash hate, uh, and that's the seventy two. I think the seventy two tops oh. is way too big. Hmm. Uh, but so that I guess that leads to the satisfaction of completing it. Uh, I don't consider that my favorite set. My favorite, or my favorite set of the seventies. But uh, it is quite a uh, – it's a bit of a task to complete that set, that's for sure. Now, I have older sets that I have completed, but uh, I would say that one because it has a little bit of a legend attached to it, uh, for sure. Somebody made the comment to me, the older the set, the more it's just about money. The newer the set, the more it's about hunting the cards. I mean, uh, how do you define new? I mean, it's well within the vintage era. The, oh, the, okay. newer, the, newer, okay. the newer you go, you know, the the more the, it's dollar bin. Oh, for you, sure, right? The, 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 you're paying you're paying for so many star cards. Yeah, think about it. I, you have, I mean, if you're hunt, if you're going after the 1979 or 1980 set, and you're you're paying a dime or a quarter for a common versus. Uh, you know, the, the 72 set or the 67 set or the 66 set, it, it, you know, when you're the higher numbers, you're getting killed. You're paying, you know, rookie Hall of Fame prices for some guy. So I, I can absolutely see that. There's more money attached uh, uh, psychologically than there is if you were, you know, working on a later set for sure. What... Um if you could go back and kind of put together different parts of different sets to make kind of your, the John Keating perfect top set, um, roughly what time period, and then stealing from different sets, and, and we'll keep this to tops vintage uh, post-war, uh, what, what elements from different sets do you like? Uh, I kind of had a, I had a, uh, I was, I don't want to mention his name, but I was in a, the, the car going to my LCS with a content creator yesterday. And I came to realize he had bought a stack of 73 uh, cards from my LCS. And I, I come to realize that my favorite two card backs of the seventies were 73 and 75, which happened to both be uh, portrait uh, backs instead of horizontal backs. So uh, I'd probably choose a portrait back um, of either one of those two years. Uh, 75 is a little harder to read because of the combination, but I will choose 75. So I'll choose the, the backs of those. Uh, I'll choose the 74 all-star subset. I'll choose the 76 all-time greats subset to throw in there. Uh, I will do any team subset that doesn't have the Chicago Cubs floating heads. So uh, probably I, I, I have the 56 set, so I'd probably do the 56 uh, team cards. Uh, league leaders, man, that's a tough one because, uh, there's some league leader cards out there that have the floating heads, which I don't necessarily like, but it'd be interesting. But, uh, I would choose, here's what I would choose. I would choose mid sixties league leader cards because they were filled with yes. Aaron Mays, Clemente, uh, Koufax Gibson. So I would choose any one of those that had any one of those big dogs in them. Uh, checklists. I would choose. 
73 tops because I think they were orange. Uh, the actual field. White border, black border. Which, what are you thinking? Uh, I don't like too much white border. Um, like, I don't like, I mean, 77 is okay and 73 is okay, but I don't like too much. I'd rather have a 70 tops over any of the white border top sets. Uh, 71 tops obviously is iconic. So the as little white as possible. And that's why when Stadium Club out, I was just blown away about uh, full bleeds because it was – what a concept, huh? I think so. I'm here right now looking at these 94 Ted Williams cards, which are gorgeous, but they're just a, a JWE throwaway, but they're they're gorgeous. So I would I would want a full bleed set, but uh, a back-in-the-day full bleed set. I'll take sure. the – Take the T205s. How's that sound? That's a great compromise. The gold border. You're going to think I'm making this up. I literally was showing the gold borders to my father-in-law this morning. Is one of the prettiest sets I thought was ever made. I'll take those. Yeah. All right. Very cool. Did I cover everything there? I'm, what am I missing? Yeah, I think I covered well, uh, Roughly what time period would the set be from? I know. I think I know the answer. but uh, You would think I would say the 70s. Um, oh, I knew uh, you like your best Hall of players and the, the best players, the best, the most fully stacked time period of baseball was probably 55 to 65. Uh, so yeah. sometime in there and, and even digging down on a more micro level, think about the national leaguers from 65 to 75, you know, Banks, Aaron, Mays, Clemente. game results. Yeah, exactly. I'm just, I, you know, Mickey Mantle was pretty much the only one who was playing in the American League, and then the National well, League had everybody. Brooks Robinson made, I think, 19 All Star games. That's great. That shows, yeah, no comment. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I was baiting you on that one. Um, <laughs> all right. That was five questions. Sean Keating. I feel better now. I feel much better. Yeah. So, uh, I, where can people find you? Because I love uh, the reincarnation of your show and then the reincarnation of the show again. I'm in my um, basement. If they want to yeah. find No. Where can they find you? Uh, I occasionally uh, uh, put out content on that 70s card show. Uh, I can be on Twitter all the time at 70s card and uh, occasionally a podcast as well. So I, I hope to get more stuff going. It's been a little crazy lately, but hope to get more stuff going soon. Well, you're very humble. It's a fantastic podcast and definitely worth uh, watching. And I appreciate you coming on today. Thank you, sir. Everybody else, see you.